Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 163 with Janine Roth. Some of my favorite parts of this episode were when she teaches us how to heal our relationship with food and our bodies. I also love when she teaches us how to quit dieting once and for all and how to self-soothe. I also love her powerful process to master your negative thoughts about your body and food. But there is so much more wisdom and inspiration that you get in the full episode. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head on over to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 163 right now. Janine, welcome to the show. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. Now, before we dive in, can you tell us about your story and how you got to where you are today doing the wonderful work that you do in the world now? How did this all happen for you? Yeah, I was a very unhappy and I would say chubby child. I don't know if you use the word chubby over there, but chubby meaning really hunky legs and arms. And I was convinced that my unhappiness as a child was because of the size of my body. And so as I grew up, I wanted to be thinner and I started dieting at age 11. And then I went on a lot of radical diets, the one hot fudge Sunday a day diet, the thousand calorie a day sugar diet, the all protein diet. I went on the Atkins diet, which was sort of a a version of the paleo diet, not quite. And then regular diets, Weight Watchers and Stillman's and all kinds of diets. And there was this constant suffering, constant belief that if only I could lose weight and stay thin, then my life would be better. In the meantime, I did feel like it was the source of everything that was wrong. Finally, after gaining and losing over a thousand pounds, probably more like 1500 pounds and being anorexic at one point, weighing 82 pounds and then doubling my weight within a couple of months, I realized that at least for me, I was 28 then, life wasn't really worth living if I was gonna keep this diet binge cycle up, losing and gaining 10 pounds every week or so. And I made a plan to kill myself. I was suicidal and made a plan to kill myself and started researching. This is before Google and the internet, guns and drugs and other kinds of ways to really, really get rid of myself. And I was in a bookstore doing it and happened to see a book called Fat is a Feminist Issue. It was the first book I'd ever seen that that actually convinced me that all this stuff with food and weight was a way of expressing something I didn't know how to express any other way. That if my weight could talk to me, it would have a lot to say. That I wasn't attending to my feelings, to my beliefs, to myself. I wasn't taking care of myself at all. I just really wanted to get rid of myself. And even before I was suicidal, I wanted to get rid, hack off pieces of my thighs and my arms and my face. There was a kind of self-hatred that was going on. I didn't know how to be kind to myself. So I stopped dieting after I read that book. I stopped dieting. And in the next couple of years, I started eating what my body wanted. I started being kind to myself. It was very difficult to be kind to myself because I nobody ever taught me how. And After a while, I started eating what sort of a normal diet instead of only sugar and losing weight. And it was from there that I decided to talk to other women about what they were doing. And I started a very small group in a friend's house one night and realized that a lot of women felt the same way. And that was a while ago. Why is this happening? Why are we so obsessed with? what we look like. Why is that happening? 
Well, you know, Melissa, I've never found a satisfying answer to that question. So I don't, I don't ask myself that anymore. Why is it happening? It's evolved over decades and it's how it is right now. My, you know, my question that I say to myself and to all the people I work with is how do we change this? What do we do about it? How can we start treating ourselves differently? injecting kindness and compassion and a different kind of thinking into the whole framework of food and women and bodies. For me, that's where the traction starts hitting, which is, okay, now what? What do we do? Because with each person that refuses to buy into it, with each woman that is able to see oh, I've been treating myself with such hatred, either because I have internalized it because that's how I was treated or internalized it from my family and environment or internalized it because the culture objectifies women. And that's becoming even more and more apparent now with all of the different movements that women are starting and how we're standing in our own spaces. I mean, we're sort of like owning these bodies in a way that we haven't done before. But what is important is that we see the state of it, which is what you just said, which is that we look down at our bodies and we want to slice off parts of them. We believe somehow we've drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, that if we could only lose weight, then we would be happier. We'd be thin and therefore happy, or we'd fit in and therefore happy. And that's a lie. Besides kindness and compassion and coming back to the present moment, how do we heal this relationship with our body and food? Well, if all you ever did was be kind to yourself and be in your body, it would be healed. That's the first thing to know. And I will talk to you about more, but those are really two keys. And people skip over them as if, yeah, yeah, I heard that, been there, done that. But really, that's not true. Most of us, and I can't say this enough, are not kind to ourselves. We have a practice in my retreats called the old sweetheart practice, which is that when you're hurting, when you're in pain, when you feel rejected or abandoned or unwanted, that you learn how to be with yourself, that you learn how to soothe yourself. And that changes everything. That changes everything because most of us turn to food because we don't know how to be with ourselves and food becomes the comforting presence. And so learning how to turn towards yourself, feel the feelings that you feel, ouch, that hurt. I felt hurt or I felt scared or I felt abandoned and just name the feeling, be with it for a moment. And then as if you were being with a child, really taking yourself up inside your own heart and saying, oh, sweetheart, oh, sweetheart, I'm so sorry you're hurt. What can I do for you? I'm here. Now, this might sound corny. And, you know, for a long time, I was quite cynical about this. Oh, more inner children. How many more practices for inner children do we have to have? But And the truth is, most of us don't do this. And the reaching for food comes out of the fact that we don't. How do you self-soothe? Do you have a similar practice to that? When you have a challenging feeling, you put your hands on your heart. Did I get that right? Yeah, both of my hands on my heart. And it's almost like I pat my heart, like I would kind of like caress a cat, you know, that sort of motion. Yes. And what do you say to yourself? I say to myself, it's okay. You are safe. 
Yes. Yeah, and I just keep repeating that. It's okay. You are safe. It's okay. And I just keep doing it until I feel my nervous system come out of fight or flight and come back into rest and digest. So I kind of do that with my eyes closed for a couple of minutes. I don't even know how long I do it for. I just do it until I feel like my body's not in fight or flight anymore. Yes. That's really, really good because I think what the neuroscientists say is that you really have to stay with something for at least a couple of breaths to really lay down new neural pathways or a different track or a different way of doing something. To really get the message, it takes a couple of breaths at least to get that. And it sounds like when you do that, you do that enough with give yourself enough time to really go into rest and digest. Exactly. And then right. those feelings of wanting to numb with food or social media or alcohol subside or even spending, you know, wanting to go shopping or spend money online, that feeling subsides because I have filled myself up from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. Yes. So yes. what advice would you have for someone who has a very, very loud inner mean girl when it comes to their body and their relationship with their body and food? Well, what we're talking about, these two things are interrelated because to the extent that we are identified or merged, we'll call it the inner mean girl, that's good, then we're not kind to ourselves. We don't feel like we deserve the, oh, sweetheart. We don't feel like we deserve to put both hands over our hearts and say, it's okay, you are safe here. When you're merged with the critic or the mean girl or the crazy aunt in the attic, that means you are believing what she or he is saying. And so the thought of being kind to yourself doesn't even occur to you. So your three-step process is lovely. I talk about something similar in my latest book, This Messy Magnificent Life, about just simply disengaging and then turning towards, because until you disengage from this mean part, there's no chance of you turning towards yourself with kindness mm, absolutely. because you just don't think you deserve it. Mm. So when you are able to disengage at that point, you choose love instead. And another way of saying that is that you, you are able to be Rather than the mean girl and the mean adult, you're able to be the kind one. For someone who is listening and they think, oh my gosh, it feels like such a stretch to get to that place of listening to my body and not eating when I'm not hungry and eating when I'm hungry and listening to what my body wants to eat and not eating in front of the TV and eating until I'm full, not till I'm bursting. You know, for someone listening who's thinking that feels like such a stretch to get there, what is your advice for them? I would say that you start slowly, teeny little baby steps. Pick one of those guidelines, like eat when you're hungry or eat sitting down or eat without distractions and do it once a day. Just one, one of those guidelines once a day and see what happens. You can't, you can't, it's sort of like on January 1st, people say, oh, I'm going to go to the gym every single day and, and then they don't and then they fall off and then they don't even start. So just starting, we call it taking an aim in my work. We take an aim. I aim to eat when I'm hungry once for the next five days. And the next part is to have somebody to check in with or 
you know, what they in the 12 step programs call accountability. It's good to have support. It's really, really good to have support. So if you tell yourself that once a day I'm going to eat when I'm hungry and you have a friend that you can check in with at the end of the day or email with or text with, how'd you do today? Well, it makes things lighter and easier and you feel supported and support is really important. And I know a lot of women especially feel like, oh no, I don't want to bug that person or I don't want to ask them to help me or we have got to let go of that because we all need each other. You know, we can do this together and we don't have to be isolated So we need to let go of that limiting thought inside our mind that, oh, we're going to bug so-and-so. You're not going to bug them. We are here to be of service to each other and to help each other and to support each other, aren't we? Yes. That again, it's about what step could you take today? What do you have a friend that you can check in with today? Because if it's an agreement a previously decided upon agreement that you don't have to go through every day. Is it okay to call this person? Am I going to be bothering this person? What if they're in the middle of something like that? So having a buddy or a partner that you can check in with and be accountable to is very helpful. And, you know, in in our retreats, we divide up into groups of five after the retreat is over and meet once a month. And then each group of five is texting each other and emailing each other constantly in between the meetings. So, and it's all about here's what's going on and sharing the good news, but also sharing when it's challenging. So, How do we quit dieting once and for all? How do we quit it for good? Well, I'm not sure that there's any for good, forever, never, or those words. I don't usually use words like that. I think following the eating guidelines, which aren't a diet at all, understanding, you know, as your first step in your three step process that you you have some kind of awareness about what dieting is doing to you, what shaming and blaming and or the lack of trust is doing. So I think it's a back and forth process and people grow in, in bits and spurts and you grow by having a direct experience of something and seeing, oh, I, it feels much better like this. Oh, okay. And then maybe something will trigger you and you'll get reactive about something and you'll turn to dieting again. And then you'll realize, oh, that doesn't feel good. You know, we learn the process itself is the goal. It's not that there's an end result that we want to get to, because when we get to one end result, we just raise the bar and have another end result. It's not like that. It's what we learn by going through this is the goal. We learn how to be with ourselves, how to be kind to ourselves, how to be aware of what we do, how to occupy our bodies. Besides asking yourself what you're grateful for, which is wonderful, is also asking yourself what's not wrong right now. I write about this in the in the chapter in this messy, magnificent life. I talk about how when I was studying with Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist teacher, at his meditation center in the south of France, I thought it was going to be warm every day and I packed for warm weather and instead it was cold and damp and clammy and I was just sort of miserable. I felt like I was sort of in a hellhole and not in a meditation center. And one morning he came in and he said, how many of you do not have a toothache right now? (laughs) Do not have a toothache. And Of course, most of the room, if not 99.9% of the people, raised their hands, didn't have a toothache. And he said, and how many of you are appreciating that you don't have a toothache? And of course, nobody raised their hand. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, 
when something is wrong, that's all we can do is focus on what it is. And yet when it's not wrong, we just skip on to the next thing that is wrong. <laughs> 